Hello and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on my playlist, Dining with the Disappeared, where we talk about people who have vanished. We discuss the circumstances surrounding their disappearance, we talk about what happened, and then we talk a little bit about the place they disappeared from. And because this is Dining with Death, a lot of times that place is a restaurant or a bar. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. Of all of the disappearances I have covered and the many more I have learned about over the years I've been interested in these types of stories, this one stands alone. I'll be honest with you, this case gives me the creeps. I'm a very skeptical person. I like to find a rational explanation for everything, but there is something very, very strange and disturbing about this disappearance. It really makes you wonder if there are strange things happening because there is no earthly explanation for what happened to Brandon Swanson. Brandon Swanson was, at the time of his disappearance, a 19-year-old student in Minnesota. He was studying at Minnesota West Community and Technical College's Canby campus. The spring semester had just come to an end and Brandon and his friends had been celebrating the end of the school year. Around 1.45 a.m. on May 14, 2008, Brandon Swanson called his parents using his cell phone. He told them that he had left a party and that on his way home, he had driven his car into a ditch. He got out of the car to make that phone call to his parents and he was speaking with them on the phone. He got out of the car and was walking around talking to his parents. He told them he was unsure of his exact location, but that he thought he was near Lind, Minnesota. Brandon's parents immediately got in their car and headed towards where Brandon thought he was at. Brandon stayed on the phone with his parents the entire time, from the moment he called while they put their shoes on and got in the car and drove to him. The call lasted 47 minutes and through it all, Brandon was talking with his parents. As Brandon's parents neared the location where Brandon said he was, their hearts sank. They did not see him. Brandon told them his car lights were on and that they should be able to clearly see them even though the car was down in a little bit of a ditch. His parents saw nothing. They began flashing their headlights on and off over and over and asked Brandon, do you see our flashing lights? Brandon told them time and again, no, nothing. At around 2.30 in the morning, 47 minutes into this phone call, Brandon's mother heard Brandon yell, oh shit, and then nothing. That was it. That was the last time anyone ever heard Brandon speak and the last time anyone knew that he was alive. One second he was on the phone speaking to his mother and the next he had vanished. Yep, pretty creepy. I personally envision him standing outside the car with the headlights, you know, into the tall grass and then all of a sudden somebody just appears in front of him. That's like where my mind goes to, but I don't think that's what happened here. Brandon's parents spent the next several hours driving around looking for him. At 6.30 in the morning, they reported him missing to the Lind police, who told them it was normal for kids Brandon's age to stay out partying the last day of college and, you know, celebrate that. Annette Swanson, Brandon's mother, actually remembers one of the officers telling her, quote, it's Brandon's right to go missing. That really rubbed her the wrong way. Later that morning, the Lind police did a cursory search for Brandon, but no trace of him was found. They then obtained Brandon's cell phone records. They found out that Brandon's initial call had come from the area of Taunton, which is along State Highway 68. Now, that's 25 miles from Lind. Brandon was nowhere near Lind. He wasn't even close to the area he told his parents he thought he was at. Brandon had been drinking that night, but his friends said not excessively. They said he wasn't even visibly intoxicated. He'd had a couple, but nothing too extreme. His parents had also been talking to him on the phone. He wasn't drunk. Once the police had the information from the cell records, a more accurate location, they began searching in that area. And before long, they found Brandon's abandoned Chevy Lumina in a ditch off a gravel road along the Lincoln County line about a mile north of Highway 68. When I was researching this case, they described how Brandon's car was up on a little mound of dirt. Now, we call that getting high centered. When you go out off-roading and you're in a car that really shouldn't be on those kind of roads, you get high-centered. The car gets hung up on a bump in the road and the wheels don't touch the ground. And that's exactly what happened to Brandon. He got high-centered. 
Brandon said the car wasn't really damaged, but it was just high up enough to keep the wheels from touching the ground on one side, so it was disabled. There was nothing suspicious found around the car, no blood, no sign of a struggle. There weren't even any tracks because the car was found in really high spring grass, so they couldn't even tell what direction Brandon might have walked off in. There was a grain silo in the area, so they searched around that and they found nothing. But on that grain silo, there was a red light, and investigators thought it was possible that that red light Brandon told his parents he had seen led him to believe he was closer to Lind than he was. It wasn't lights from town he was seeing, it could have just been the light from the grain silo. They brought in search dogs and even aerial support from the Twin Cities. An entire team of bloodhounds was brought in from South Dakota, and they picked up a three-mile scent trail that followed the field roads along an abandoned farm and then down to the Yellow Medicine River. Now, when Brandon was on the phone with his parents, his father remembered he had said that he was passing fences and that he could hear water nearby. This would have been the Yellow Medicine River. At this point, a theory began to form, and that was, of course, that Brandon had fallen into the river and drowned. So they brought in boats from the state's Department of Natural Resources, and they had them search the river, up and down, and wherever there were gates and filters installed, anywhere that a body could possibly get hung up. They had people out on 4x4s and ATVs looking everywhere. They found absolutely nothing. After days and then more than a week of searching, most of the efforts were called off. One of the sheriffs continued to walk the Yellow Medicine River in that area every single day for a month straight, confident that she would find something. She did not. Late in the fall, after the fields were harvested and the tall plants were cut down, they thought surely they would find something. They brought the dogs back in who continued to follow scents that might be linked to Brandon. They didn't find a single clue. The snow came, the snow melted, nothing. What on earth had happened to Brandon Swanson? He was literally talking on the phone one second and the next minute he was gone. Even if Brandon had slipped and fallen into the river, everyone familiar with that area said they absolutely would have found him. People are baffled. They're still baffled. This disappearance makes no sense. He was right there by his car. Even if he had walked a ways away, he was telling his parents that he could hear water nearby. That's a far cry from saying, I'm standing by a river, you know? You know the difference between hearing water in the distance and standing next to a river? They don't sound anything alike. He never told his parents he was by a river. He just said he could hear water nearby. Now, that doesn't mean the water wasn't a little closer than he thought. But this was not a raging river. It's described as a tributary. Yes, it's something you could fall into, but it's also something you could get out of. I mean, look at this thing. This is not the white water rapids of the Colorado. It's a little meandering stream that becomes a river in places. Even the investigators and the searchers agree with one member of the team who is very familiar with the area that stated, there really is nothing to indicate that he's in the river. Annette Swanson, Brandon's mother, says she does not believe that her son is in the river. And the car went into a ditch, but he seemed to be okay. Uh, correct. He, he said he was fine, but he was not injured. And, you know, in fact, when we did find his vehicle, there was no damage to it. It was simply muddy from being on a gravel road, um, but no damage to the vehicle. What was it like that night to be going through this and so close to your son but so far from your son yeah um you know as as you know as brandon tried to explain to us where his location was and he was extremely sure of himself he he felt confident in in where he was at um and that we were the ones that were confused about you know how to get to him and as the conversation went on, as the minutes ticked by, you know, it, it, it came to a point where as, as long as Brandon was on the phone, as long as he was talking, as long as we had contact, it was okay. We would be okay. But the minute that he, that that call dropped, I just became sick. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was very, very bad. And just could hardly fathom 
you know, what was happening at that point. So what happened? Many authorities and searchers believe that Brandon did go into the water that night, but that he made it out, and that he then froze to death trying to get back to his car. It was barely 40 degrees that night, so even though it was May, this is May in Minnesota, it's cold. Then they have information from the search dogs. At several locations near Mud Creek, north of Porter, search dogs alerted to human body parts, the scent of human remains, but no remains were ever discovered. That doesn't mean that remains were never there, and there was more than one alert by the dogs. Something had been there. The problem with the theory that Brandon fell into the water is that after his parents lost contact with him, they eventually hung up on the call and called his phone back. It rang and rang. If the phone had gone into the water and been destroyed by the water damage, it wouldn't be ringing. It would have started going right to voicemail. If Brandon fell into the water and his phone didn't, they would have found the phone, which they did not. So again, this just raises more questions. Something you should know about Brandon, he was legally blind in his left eye and he had to have glasses to see. But in the dark early morning that he went missing, he left his glasses in the car he wasn't wearing them when he was walking around, talking to his parents on the phone. Just before his last words to his father, just before yelling, oh shit, Brandon said to his father, not another fence, meaning he had come upon another fence. But was it another fence or was it the same fence? Was Brandon walking in circles? One firefighter familiar with the area said that he feels Brandon may have slipped into an unmarked cistern, a well which apparently are common in this area, and they are unmarked. Brandon could have literally walked into a very deep hole in the ground and been swallowed up by the earth. Oh, I hate to think of that. Him just down in a deep, dark hole, screaming for help, and no one heard him. It's an absolutely terrifying thought. Absolutely terrible. Another theory is that Brandon had some type of mental breakdown, but this theory doesn't hold much water. His parents said he was lucid. His speech was clear. He seemed fine. And then, of course, we have the theory that Brandon chose to disappear. Again, most people don't put much stock in this. Why would he be on the phone with his parents asking for help, for them to come and locate him if he was trying to disappear? Why would his cell phone have pinged off the towers nearby where the call was coming from? If he was trying to disappear, he would be somewhere else. Then, of course, you've got the really wild theories. Brandon was abducted by aliens. He was taken by some kind of cryptid. The Wendigo supposedly stalks Minnesota. And then there is the legend of the Minnesota Dogman, who supposedly roams the fields, especially in the spring and at night. But you know how I feel about these types of things. Like I said in the beginning, this is just a very, very strange disappearance. I spend a lot of time in the hills and I spend a lot of time in the same places in the hills. And you know that area, you get to know those spots. You know that there's a little overhang over there. You know that there's a little rock crevice over there. You know where to look. If someone went missing in the areas I'm familiar with, I would know where to look. Well, they looked there. They looked there not once, not twice, but over and over. They found nothing. I think this is one of those cases that will either never be solved or Brandon's bones will turn up in a most unusual place at some point in the future, somewhere unexpected or somewhere just small enough or tucked away enough to be missed. It's very sad. He was only 19 years old. And while yes, there is always a chance that he's still alive, I don't think that chance is very great in this case, unfortunately. Brandon's parents have pretty much dedicated their lives to this tragic event. Annette was very, very upset by that comment made to her on the morning her son vanished when the officer said it's Brandon's right to go missing. So she decided to do something about it. Brian and Annette Swanson, working with House Minority Leader Marty Seifert and Senator Dennis Fredrickson, sponsored Brandon's Law. And on May 7, 2009, Governor Tim Pawlenty signed it into law. This law will require law enforcement to take a missing persons report without any delay after being notified that someone has gone missing under dangerous circumstances. It doesn't matter the person's age or who is making the report. They must immediately conduct a preliminary investigation to determine if the person is missing and whether or not that person is endangered. 
Now here on Dining with Death, we always talk about the last place the person was known to be. Brandon was coming from a party. It was probably just a keg party with some mixed drinks, the kind of party that happens every weekend near every college in the country all the time. It's really too bad that after a night of celebrating and finishing that year of college, this is how his semester came to a close. My heart breaks for this family. What they have been through is every parent's worst nightmare. I can't even imagine how they feel or the stress that they have lived under. It's just awful. Of course, if you have any information, if you think you might know anything at all that can help this family, please call the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department at 507-694-1664. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Dining with the Disappeared. Like the video if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. It really does help. The other thing you can do to support me is to join my Patreon. We have an ultimate goal here of raising money for cold case DNA storage testing and you can help with that. I sure appreciate your support. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.